Welcome to Adventures with a Very Small Lathe. In this episode, I'll be continuing to build the clamp prototype I described last time. This time I'll be turning the two shafts which keep the jaws in alignment and control their spacing. To make efficient use of the material, I plan to machine both parts from a single piece of silver steel, with as little wasted material as possible. The first main operation will be to turn down the diameter of the main part of the shaft. As this extends a long way for such narrow material, it will need to be supported by a live centre in the tailstock, so I faced and centred the end of the part. I used a DCMT insert tool instead of my regular CCMT tooling so I could reach the end of the shaft without catching the live center. It took me a while to get the length of cut right as I was working as close as possible to the chuck. Still this diameter flexes quite easily under the tool pressure so I was trying to keep the length, extended length to a minimum. Using a really sharp hand ground tool would probably have helped here but laziness means I still haven't learned how to grind my own tools well.
By keeping the cuts very light, I managed to avoid too much flexing. Once the main part of the shaft was the correct diameter, I tidied up the shoulder. Normally I'd use a small radius tool for this, but my choice of DCMT inserts is more limited. There was very slight taper to the shaft, but entirely within acceptable tolerances. I need to get around to measuring the twist in my lathe bed to ensure that sort of taper is minimised. The length and narrow diameter of the centre hole meant that drilling the part had to be done very carefully. The initial 2mm twist drill got clogged with chips very easily, so I switched to a larger drill close to the final diameter to increase the hole size and allow the chips to clear, before switching back to the smaller drill to proceed with the depth. I didn't trust the cheaper larger drill to pile it safely into the raw material, and I didn't have a better quality drill the right size for the tap. The hole has now been opened up, so I'm using the smaller 2mm drill once again. I switched between the two drill sizes a few times before the hole was to depth.
the final drill pulse is with a 2.6mm twist drill to give the M3 tap a little bit of breathing room. The next step is one that is hard to show on the schematic. The shaft OD is 6mm, obviously larger than the 4mm slots it has to fit into, so two flats need to be machined into the side of the shaft where it needs to fit into the slot. The fit in the slot will ensure that the screw at the back can be tightened, closing the clamp jaws without the shaft or the clamp jaws rotating as well. It's not quite that simple however, as two of the three slots are curved. Rather than being flat, the sides of the shaft need to be machined to a diameter matching the curvature of the slots. I mounted a vise on the rotary table with the back jaw the correct distance from the centre of rotation. Due to the mistakes I made in episode 5, this was not the radius from the earlier version to the schematic, but the corrected radius to make up for the misdrawled centre holes. I set the cut adapt to the thickness of the plate plus a small margin to ensure there was no interference. The first cut is the convex face to make with the outer curve of the slot. It's very easy for the part to flex in this setup so to minimise it I set the table to make very light cuts per pass. At first there was almost no sign of any material removal at all. I set the table to cut a little deeper and fed the rotary table very slowly by hand to ensure the feed rate didn't apply too much pressure and cause the part to flex. Turning the table directly by hand proved to be fiddly so I engaged the worm and did the feed using the table's dial. I found I had more success with an even depth of cut along the length by making many passes for each adjustment of the table. The first pass after moving the table was done fairly slowly and removed most of the material. Subsequent passes at the same depth were much faster and cleaned up the material left close to the top where the part had flexed.
Cutting the concave face was much the same, but much more difficult to measure. I don't have a mic with an anvil for concave faces, so I ended up having to guess when I was close, and then test the part against the slot it's intended to fit. Once the fit was right, the part is able to move freely along the slot as hoped. There's around 20mm of spare stock at the other end of the part, which was required up until now to hold the part in the vise. As I mentioned earlier, I plan to use it to make a second part, the threaded shaft at the rear of the jaws, with a thumb wheel for adjusting the stock for the jaws. It's vital that the protruding lengths either side of the wheel are coaxial, or adjusting it will cause the jaws to wobble and could jam. This means all the diameters should ideally be done with a single setup to eliminate concentricity errors. The first diameter is the threaded portion that will gauge with the lower jaw. It needs to be just under 8mm long to avoid protruding through and interfering with the plate. As usual, I switched to a smaller radius tool to tidy up the corner and make the final adjustments.
I used a chamfer tool to ensure the thread die got an easy start. Cutting the thread with the tailstock die holder was pretty straightforward. I adapted this cheap Morse Taper 2 die holder to fit the Proxon tailstock in a previous video, linked at the top right of the screen. The thickness of the thumb wheel needs to be 2mm and the top length of the shaft is 5mm. The marking lines were too early though, as first I need to bring the OD into concentric with the current setup. I recording adding a straight knurl to the outer surface but accidentally deleted the footage. To turn the final length to the correct diameter I needed to make a plunge cut somewhere behind the thumb wheel. My first attempt was with an insert tool but I just couldn't get to cut. With the benefit of hindsight at least one of the reasons is obvious. I'm a long way from the chuck compared with the only 6mm held in the collet and there's way too much flex in the puff plunging at this distance. This is attempt 2 with a freshly sharpened high speed steel tool, and at first it went a lot better. I had to adjust the tool height to slightly below centre to get it cutting. Before I reached the centre, the tool jammed and pulled itself underneath the part, bending the shaft. This part is unfortunately a write-off, as the bend is worst at a critical part of the shaft where it's held in the collet. There was also deformation near the thumb wheel, so I threw the whole thing out. The main cause is plunging way too far from the chuck, but the large width of the tool contributed to making the cutting pressure too high. The crash took a chunk out of the tool as well, so I'll need to learn how to regrind it. I'm going to remake these parts with a couple of changes to the technique. Firstly I won't bother trying to remake both from a single piece of stock. Secondly I'll consider reordering the operations to reduce the flex when milling the curved surfaces. Most of this will be off camera and next episode we'll focus on making progress once the two parts are remade.